spiritual opportunities. Next month we're going to have the fall festival. Before you leave today, after the morning service, there will be, I think Brian said, a brief meeting. I didn't say it. My reaction was we may time him, but no, we won't. But remember the meeting today after the morning service for the fall festival. Uh, so Now, we normally have a lot of spiritual opportunities. Later today at 5 o'clock, there will be the family Bible hour. First part of that service will be a study of Genesis. Wednesday night at 7, classes for all ages and also a, a Devo. So, Thursday morning, 10.30, study again the Gospel of John. And especially the men, Saturday morning at 9, there will be the monthly business meeting. Ladies, if you have something the men want to discuss, give it to your husband. If your husband's not in the business meeting, give it to the Blantons or Brian or one of the men. So, if you have something you want discussed, we'll be glad to do it. So, men, Saturday at 9 for the monthly business meeting. And looking ahead to October, there'll be bowling on the 11th and then the fall festival on the 19th. That are all in addition to the regular times of meeting. So, uh, thanks again for coming this morning. Regulars, glad to have you. Visitors, glad especially to have you. We're ready now to begin our worship to God in prayer. So would you like to bow with me? Father, thanks so much for the privilege of prayer. Thanks for our country and the many freedoms that we enjoy. And thanks, Father, that we can assemble together at this time to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we trust, Father, that everything we do today will challenge and equip us to go forth and live for your Son and truly be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And thanks again for Jesus, what he's meant in our lives in the past, what he can even mean today and the future as well. And we pray these thoughts in his wonderful name, amen. We're ready now to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as Vance leads us. So. Good morning. Please take out a songbook with me and turn to number 78. Number 78. Number 78, please. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love is
Six, two, five, please. Six hundred twenty five. Turn in Mark number 922. 922. We'll use 922 later following our lesson. And now, if you would, number 394. 394, please. Following this song, we're taking the Lord's Supper together. 394. He <coughs> took my burdens all day up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can see.
If you have your Bibles and would like to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll start with verse 23. First of all, as everyone have a breath of breath of breath. Okay. We start with uh, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians and uh, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I received, delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever eateth this bread and drinketh this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us bow. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for Jesus, who came to this earth freely, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross for our many sins. At this time, dear Lord, we ask you to bless this bread, which represents his body, whom he gave freely that we may partake of it in a manner which will be pleasing to thee. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us bow again and thank him for the fruit of the vine. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank thee, dear Lord, for Jesus and the blood he was shed on the cross for our sins. We pray, dear Lord, at this time we'll remember that. And we pray, dear Lord, we'll partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. And may we partake of it in a manner which will be pleasing to thee. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we'll give um, thanks for all the blessings, and we have an opportunity to give back. In the hallway on the right, there's a box that if you'd like to uh, to give, then uh, you can place uh, place it in that. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the church of Galatia, Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Let us bow. Our righteous Heavenly Father, we truly thank you, dear Lord, for all the blessings you shed upon us. And we thank you, dear Lord, for this week that you've given us and the gains throughout this week, that we may be able to give back and this money's be used for the upbuilding and the strengthening of thy kingdom. For this we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. If you will turn with me to Luke 17, 28 through 33. Luke 17, 28 through 33 is what we're going to read this morning. Luke 17, 28 through 33. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, 
They did eat, they drank, they brought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Morning. morning. Good to see you this morning and uh, good to be here. If you'll open up there to Luke 17, we're going to get started there in just a minute. Um, again, it's good to be together. It's good to spend this time together. And as Christians, I think much of what Jesus has to say in Luke 17 is, is, is what we uh, what we should focus our lives on. That's where our attention should be, is on the second coming of our Lord. And in Luke 17, that of course is what Jesus is focused on. Um, we, uh, we think about, um, you know, the Word of God and, and the message that it has to teach. If you are trying to memorize verses in Scripture... There are three you should work with first. Uh, you think in the New Testament, there are three really short verses. You may remember John eleven thirty five. How many of us have, have memorized that one um, and utilized that in our Bible classes at times uh, when our teacher asks us to memorize a verse? A um, lot of great wealth there, though, of teaching. Uh, in John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept over the death of his, uh, of his friend and over the, the sadness of his family. You also might think about 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16. Rejoice always. And there's another verse that precedes that. It's equally good to put in there. Pray continually or pray without ceasing. It's just a tad bit longer. But those are a couple verses you want to start memorizing. Those are a good place to start. Here's another one, Luke 17, 32. And it's going to be the focus of our attention today. Uh, Jesus just simply says, in describing his second coming, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Think about what he's saying in a very short two-word verse, um, or two-word, I should be able to count, three-word verse um, there in remembering Lot's wife. Uh, I don't know how much thought you've given to her or to what was going on with her, but we're going to spend a little time here at the beginning uh, with uh, Genesis uh, chapters 18 and 19. But if you go back to the immediate context of Luke 17, Notice what, what he's saying here. Uh, he says in verse 28, Just as in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. Right? They're just doing the normal things that you do. Right? All those people in Sodom got up just like it was any other day. Uh, they were living their lives. And then suddenly things changed. Uh, life um, uh, was brought to a sudden end. God brought immediate, sudden destruction upon the people, didn't he? Uh, think about that for just a minute. 
Um, it's that same kind of imagery or, or that same kind of idea that's taught in the New Testament about the second coming of Christ. How many times does Jesus and Paul and Peter talk about the second coming as a thief in the night, as something that's going to come very suddenly, um, not something that we're going to necessarily be aware of, uh, there's not going to be all these signs of his second coming. There's not going to be some kind of uh, prophet who goes out beforehand saying, per, like Jonah, right, uh, going through Nineveh. It's not going to be like that. God's given us all the warning we need. Now the point is what? You need to be ready. And you need to be ready at a moment's notice. Um. And so when you think about this text and about the, the need he's trying to um, compel us toward in being ready, he simply says, remember Lot's wife. So for a few minutes, I want to go back uh, to that time frame in Genesis 18 and 19 and talk about uh, the... Um, what occurred there in Sodom, what led up to it, and ultimately what God did, and what was the reaction of God's people. Before we get to 18, let's back up just for a moment. If you go to Genesis 13, Genesis 13, we have uh, Abram and Lot are traveling. Uh, they are traveling together. Of course, you may remember Lot is the nephew of, of Abram or Abraham, uh, and he has joined with Abram on this journey. And as time went on, God blessed both Abraham and Lot, and they began to accumulate wealth and, and a following of, of family and servants. And it became to a point where both had grown where they were beginning to fight and argue with one another. And in Genesis 13, Abraham sees what's going on, Abram at the time, and he, he's, he doesn't like that. And so he devises a plan with Lot to solve this issue that uh, he's going to allow Lot to choose the direction he's going to go, and he'll go the opposite. And he gives Lot the option to choose whichever direction he wanted to go. If you go to Genesis 13 um, and verse number 11, the text says us that Lot chose to go into uh, the Jordan Valley. Now this is an area down near what we now know as the Dead Sea. Um, it was at the time a very fruited plain. It was... Um, it obviously had an accumulation of people. And so Lot decides to go east. And so Abram says, I'll go west. And so as it would play out, where would Abram go but to the land of Canaan, which would eventually become the promised land. Uh, we sing that song, to Canaan's land, I'm on my way. Well, that all was kind of established in where Lot chose to go, interestingly enough. But Lot, however, chooses to go to the valley area. Um, now, but I do want you to know what was noted even in Genesis 13 about that place. Verse 13 of chapter 13. Now the men of so Sodom were wicked, great sinners. He uses two different adjectives to describe um, their sin. He doesn't just call them sinners, but he calls them wicked sinners and greatly wicked sinners. Um, so even as Lot is making his choice, notice where he's choosing to go. Now as Christians, we understand something that even for us who have chosen to follow the plan of God to follow Jesus, to become Christians, to become his followers, we, we yet live in a very wicked world. Thank you, Bear. Sorry, this is my fall uh, allergy season. 
But we know this all too well that we live in a world that has um, that has in, embraced sin, that has embraced sin even from the very beginning, that uh, there is wickedness all around us. And the same was true in the day of Abram and Lot. Yet despite all of that, it is interesting to me that Lot chose to go into a land where it wasn't just that they were sinful, all men sinful, right? But that the Bible would describe them as greatly wicked or wicked and great sinners. And so right there from the beginning, Lot is not starting on a good footing, is he? So as you go fast forward into Genesis chapter 18. So let's go forward a little bit in time. So now we've been through the War of the Kings where Abraham came in and he saved Lot and, and, and these different kings. Well, a little bit of time has passed. I don't know how long, but there's been some amount of time. Lot's been living in Sodom. Now, as you know, when you begin to live with sin... You become what? Des, uh, desensitive to it. It doesn't affect you as much as when you initially see it. It's just like uh, you live with boys for very long. There are all kinds of smells that come into your house and into your car, into bedrooms and into bathrooms. And over time, when you live with that, you can become desensitized to it. Until one day you walk into the house, and animals bring this in as well, dogs, is you walk in, and maybe you've been on vacation, and you walk in, and you get a whiff of that. Whew. I remember recently in a car ride, we started smelling something and figured out it was somebody's shoes. I won't give away whose it was. But those things happen, right? You become okay with things and it's so easy for us to slowly slide over into acceptance without even really realizing it so i think one of the big questions is for us as we think about this are there things in my life i've begun to accept as okay even though i may not be doing them but i'm i'm okay with them going on around me not realizing that it's beginning to affect me so you we go on into the text here, and in Genesis eighteen thirty two, God has sent uh, these angels first to Abram, and then they're going to go on to Lot. But as they're there with Abram, they have told Abram God's plan to destroy Sodom, the sin in uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah and that um, that whole area. It's become so great, God cannot allow it to go on any longer. He's decided that, that it's time to do something. Now, God works like this. God will allow things for a certain period of time, but then God says, no more. That ought to be a reminder for us in our culture. There's nothing written in stone that says our culture and way of life has to last forever. We, if we begin to compromise with sin... There's a certain point where God says that's enough. And he had said that with Sodom. You remember that's the same kind of scenario with Nineveh. And that's why God sends Jonah to Nineveh. God had said it's enough. Now in Nineveh's uh, case with Jonah coming to them, they do repent. But Sodom is unrepentant. And so God says I'm going to destroy them. And then you get into this interesting dialogue in Genesis 18 where... where uh, where Abram is coming to God and he's saying, but God, will you destroy the, the righteous with the wicked? And then he, he begins to put some numbers out there to God. God, will you destroy Sodom if there's 50 people? What, what if there's 50 righteous people in Sodom? We just still destroy it? And God says, no, if, there's 50, if I can find 50, no, I won't. Now I'm paraphrasing. You go back and reread that text. But he begins at, at 50, and then it's 45, and, and he keeps going until you get down to verse thir um, 32, Genesis 18, 32. 
And Abram says, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. This is the last time, God. Okay, we couldn't find 50, we couldn't find 45, we couldn't find, you know, 20. But what about, what about suppose 10 are found there? All right, if you could just find 10 people, will you save the city? Will you not destroy it? And notice God's response. For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. Now you know the rest of the story. We don't need Paul Harvey to tell us, right? What the rest of the story is. We know that God does destroy Sodom. So what does that mean about the ten? That in Sodom, God could not even find ten people that were righteous. What did he describe it in chapter 13? Greatly or wicked and great sinners. He can't find ten righteous people. That includes the family of Lot. You notice when Lot leaves, it's not like a big horde of people, a big parade leave the city. This is not a small place. This isn't some backwoods place. But this this is a metropolitan place area and God's God can't find 10 people so at least gives us insight to how wicked they are and if you continue reading you find out exactly how wicked things have become when the angels come to Lot and those evil men and what they attempt to do with those angels This is a wicked place, a place of great wicked sinners. Genesis 19 and verse 12, um, the angels say to Lot, for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against this people has become great before the Lord. Again, another big descriptive term. It's great before the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. A couple of interesting notes there to me that just stand out is number one, God will not withhold his punishment against sin forever. There is a point when God says, I will not withhold any longer. Also notice that Despite God's anger, despite God going to destroy this place, he finds Lot, doesn't he? And he gives Lot one light amongst this great place of wickedness, an opportunity to escape. God was still mindful of Lot and that he had not given himself over to this wickedness. And so God allows him an escape. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you, but which is not common to man. But with the temptation, God will what? Provide a way of escape. And here God provides a way of escape from Lot. Not the one he wants. Not the one that even Abraham wants. But God says, this is it. You need to leave. You go on down in the text there to verse 15. Lot has already been told you need to leave. Notice what happens. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are, are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment with the city. But verse 16, But he lingered that's the english standard translation he lingered even a man whom god is ready to protect a man found amongst all this wickedness that was a man that god was was willing to save was a man who still struggled with compromise of sin it's not even that he was doing the sin right but it was his 
compromising with it. Romans chapter 1 and verse 32, when God talks about, when Paul is writing about the, the evil uh, of the Gentile world and how they were sinners, he says, not only those who do such things, but those who what? Give their approval of. Why is Lot lingering? Has he become too comfortable with sin? And so the angels basically have to force him. The text says the men, the angels, seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand. And the Lord, being merciful to him, they brought him out and set him outside the city. Was he really willing to die with the city and its sin? In Genesis 19 and verse 17, the angels go on to say to Lot, as they brought him out, one said, escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills lest you be swept away. Get out and go. That should be our response to sin. Get out and go. Don't look back. Don't look back. Just go. Unfortunately, in the texts, not everybody listened to the instruction. Genesis 19, 17 again, escape for your life. Man, there's something on the line when it comes to us and sin. And that is our eternity. We want to play with sin too much. We get too comfortable with sin. And we don't realize your life is on the line. And I'm not talking about your physical flesh. I'm talking about your eternity. And Satan wants nothing more than us to become apathetic and indifferent and comfortable with sin. And it's, it can start very small. But it will grow and it will become something in us that is truly ugly and awful. And God will only be patient so long. 2 Peter chapter 3. God is not slow concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But is what? Long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. That's God's desire. That's what God wants. He wants you to come to him. To come to him for salvation and forgiveness. That's God's desire. But he will not force you. It won't be like Lot. He is not going to come and grab you by the arm. And say come on. You need to get it right. You have time, and that's God's gift. Not time to build a better life, not time to build a better career, not time to, to, to accumulate lots of wealth or lots of knowledge. You have time. It is a gift for one reason. It is your opportunity to make things right now. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 goes on to say, God... Previous verse said he's not willing and he should perish, right? But then verse 10, but, but, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It will come. Lot needed to know that. Lot lingered and it almost cost him everything. Our lingering in sin will cost us. Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. God does not want you to be destroyed. He does not want you to come to the fate of Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife, Jesus says. Luke 17, 32. Remember her. Why? Not because of any good thing she did, but it is the fact she looked back. She looked back. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar 
of salt. She became a statue, if you will, for us, a memorial for us. And our relationship with sin, we can't look back. We, got, we have to move toward God. I don't mean forward, I mean toward God. Don't look back. Don't look back. Luke 9 and verse 57 and following, Jesus says as they're moving along the road, he gives them um, in this, they, they give him several, um, several reasons that they need to delay in coming to him. And you notice with each of them, he kind of condemns them for that, doesn't he? Not kind of, he does. And you get down to verse 62, and he says to the one who is more connected to the world, the one who is less willing to leave all for him, he says to no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. God doesn't want just your Sundays. He doesn't want just your Sunday mornings. He doesn't even just want your Wednesdays. God wants every bit of you devoted to him and to nothing else. No one putting their hand to the plow and looking backwards. Notice this. We talked about the word fit this morning, did we? Is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Paul writes... Sadly, of Demas in um, in Second uh, Timothy four and verse ten, a tragedy, a tragedy. If you read some of his other letters about Demas, you read about him being a fellow worker of Paul, um, of his prior life being one who was connected to the ministry of Paul and to the church. However, when you get to Paul's second letter, his last few lines he would write that we have recorded, Paul wrote for Demas, in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas was in danger of losing his soul. Why? Because he was in love with this present world. He couldn't let go of his sin and of the sinful world around him. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, John writes, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We cannot be fence riders. We can't try to live in, in the world and in God's kingdom all at the same time. God tells the Laodiceans that, if they try to live that way, he is going to spit them, spew them out of his mouth. Why? Because they are disgusting to him. Because they're trying to live in, 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 in God's good light while at the same time trying to attach themselves to the world. We must divorce ourselves from it and wholly devote ourselves to God himself. Um, Peter in his second epistle, chapter 2 and verse 20 uh, through 22, he says, For if after they, talking about Christians, have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. These are those who have become Christians. He goes on to say, They are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back, look back, turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. And then he gives us this proverb, a common proverb of his day. What the true uh, proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Very disgusting images, right? Especially about the dog. But you've seen a dog do it, if you've had a dog. And it's gross. 
It's just as awful and ugly when a Christian who's been freed from the world, Romans chapter 6, they've been set free through the immersion into Christ. The old man has died. The new man has been born. To see that Christian then return back to the mire of sin. To hang Jesus on a public cross once again. In sowing the seed, Jesus says in Matthew 13, verse 22, he talks about the seed sown among the thorns. Notice this seed is sown, this seed is produced, yet this, what this seed has produced is not what it should be. Matthew 13, 22, for what was sown among thorns? This is the one, the person who hears the word, who has been attentive to what God says, however, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. You can understand the gospel. You can understand what Jesus did for you. You can understand what sin does to you. You can respond to that and go through the act of baptism and yet find yourself on the other side completely lost because you forgot to do one thing. You forgot to devote yourself to God. You forgot to give up the world and wholly devote yourself to Him. Even as a Christian, one who's been immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, one who's gotten up into a new life. You've begun to walk again. And you've walked a little ways and you begin to look backwards to the quote-unquote good old days. One of the worst things I think sometimes we as parents do and hopefully we learn from this is that we talk about sin sometimes in a romantic way to our children. We romanticize the the evil things we used to do. Man, when I was a kid, I was, I, I was a mean one. I was into all kinds of things. But now you don't do that. We, we don't need to talk to our kids romanticizing the past sinful behavior. We need to talk about the ugly nature of those things. Our, sins, our, our children need to understand the true ugliness of sin the destructive power of sin. Our, ch our children and us, ourselves, need to understand what it's going to do to us. When we think about this and we think about the context of, of, of being one who's trying to live beyond those things, what are the things that put your faith in danger of being choked out and lost? Where are you most at danger? What, what is it that, that is behind you that, that, that even now it, it has a hold on you? Where is it that Satan is trying to trip you up? Is it something of a fleshly nature? And growing up, dealing with puberty and, and all the things that happen... There's a lot that we, we have around us that try to pull us into sin and try to make us comfortable with it. And you see young people growing up and, and you watch the struggle because you've been there and you understand what they're going through and you're trying to encourage them to overcome that. There are strong desires of our flesh that try to pull at us, that try to get us into situations that we shouldn't be in, that try to draw our, our eyes where they shouldn't look, that try to take our feet in places we shouldn't go, that try to get our mouths to say things we shouldn't say. 
Think about what you're in taking into your mind and into your brain. Jesus said, sin comes from what? The intentions of the heart. It's just an outgrowth of what we're thinking about, what we are concerned about. And so Satan tries to build lines to us, to hold us down, to hold us into his world. I was watching something recently, and they had a ship on there, and they had all these different lines, you know, ropes they put out to, to hold the ship into the harbor. Those who are, who've been on ships in your life, you understand that, that. There's a lot of mooring that needs to take place to hold that ship firmly to the dock. You don't want it having any kind of opportunity to break free and, and cast out. And so they work real hard, these crews, of, of getting these big ships and, and boats uh, attached, to the, um, attached to the dock, to the pier, wherever it is, because they know the danger is they put so many of these attachments because if it was to break free, it would just go out to sea. Satan also understands something. The more attachments he can entangle us in in the world, the better his chances are of holding on to us. He doesn't want us to be set free. He doesn't want us to, to, to fully devote ourselves to God. And so he's going to put things in our way, stumbling blocks to hold us back. What is it in your life that is choking out your faith? What is holding you back from fully devoting yourself to God? Is there sin in your life? Sin that you know right now is something that is keeping you from being what God wants you to be. There's nothing more important than your soul. Now, Satan's going to try to deceive you into thinking lots of other things are important. It's not. There's one eternal question, and, is it, and it is, are you right with God? Everything else falls in line from that. We're going to sing a song. My encouragement is to you is to really consider where you are spiritually. Go back one last time to Luke 17. What is the point of Luke 17? Remember Lot's wife. Why? Because when time came for escape, Lot's wife was too attached to the world to allow her to seek safety. And so because of her attachment to worldly things, to sinful behaviors, to a world of great, wicked sin, she was unable to break free and fully devote herself to God. As in the days of Lot, when people were doing their normal behaviors, they were buying, they were selling, they were getting up, going to work, doing what they did every day. And in a moment, suddenly, God said, judgment is here. It will be the same when Jesus returns. My question for you is, will you be ready? If you have a need, any need at all, please come as together we stand and as we sing. Free Christ, your open life, so hard by sin.
be seated. Number 663. 663. Six hundred sixty three, please. In thy field, I will build sickles, pray that it's true. In the fight for the right, I will tear and do. Stay my days in my praise for the journey through. Pray to the helpless to be chased. Let me live close to thee. closed in prayer. Number 280, please.
Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together safely so that we can praise your name and uplift each other and, and to study your word and find ways in which we can uh, uh, go out into this world and to be an example for the, uh, for the people out in the world and bring them hopefully to you, Father. Father, I ask that you uh, help us to keep our eyes on our goal as we go through the week and we face trials and troubles and, and, and help us, Father, to not forget as we're facing these things that you have given us so much joy and so much to be happy about, Father, and, and help us to, on a daily basis, take a minute just to, to thank you and to appreciate and to recognize the blessings that you give us, Father. Father, watch us we go our separate ways and bring us back together safely so we may worship you again. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen.